Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, ladies, for the good meal you had for everybody last night. It was exceptionally good. I'm just sorry I couldn't eat more because I only got a sample about half of what was out there. I uh, saw Jay getting into that Mexican food, and I said, Jay, if you don't watch, you'll start speaking Spanish if you eat that food. And he liked that. And it's good to kid a little bit. And, uh, you really missed a treat if you missed any night of the revival meeting because it was spiritually enlightened. And you talk about a meal, the Lord just gave us a meal every night in His Word. Amen. And if you got to come in, you know that. You know it was good every night. I had good singing. And praise the Lord for unsaved people that attended the meeting. Uh, the Lord has been gracious to us. I feel good this morning. I feel excited about the church and what God's doing, what God wants to do in the church right here in our midst. If you'd like to open your Bibles, I have a few verses in mind this morning. Uh, the first one, I suppose we could look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. That would be a good opening verse. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. This morning I'd like to ask you a question. In fact, I'd like to go beyond that. I'd like for you to ask yourself some questions as I share with you. Give yourself a little checkup this morning. Are you active or are you passive? And passive just means you're not active. Are you active or are you not active? And some different things that we're going to be looking at. Hebrews 16, I've quoted several times in, in recent services. And if you want to look at it, let's look there. might not look like a, a verse very easy to understand, but I believe there's something there that's well worth our looking at. Hebrews 16, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward His name, in that ye have ministered to the saints, and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. That's not the end of the statement. You can read the next verse, but you have ministered and do minister. Now, for you older people, and I say this with all respect, it's easy for you to remember a time in your younger days if you were active in the Lord's service when you went for God, maybe more so than you're able to go now. You did more for God, more so maybe than you're able to do now. But you have ministered. And I'm sure you have no regrets of that. But do you minister now? You know, our abilities change as we get older and so on, and we're not able to do maybe exactly like we could, but we should be able to continue ministering to others. Okay? And he says you have ministered, and do minister. Now there's one more verse, and then I want to talk to you about some things, and it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 15. And here's an interesting scripture. It talks about minister also. He says, I beseech you, brethren, and then parentheses, you know the house of Stephanus, that is the first fruits of Achaia, that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. When we think about an addiction, we automatically think about a drug addiction, an addiction to some form of medicine or that kind of thing. But he says here that the house of Stephanus, they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. And if you read this 16th chapter, you'll see that Paul was sending Stephanus along with Fortunatus. I may not be pronouncing the words right. He was sending them and he was telling the Corinthians, I want you to receive them. I want you to send them on their way. I want you to do whatever's necessary. Take care of their needs while they're there and so on. But he was saying that the house of Stephanus 
they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. You know, there are some addictions that can be good. And it would be good if we would addict ourselves to the ministry of the saints. You know, just let it become a habit. Just open up our homes and make whatever we have available so that we can minister to the saints. Not only to the saints, the saints are simply saved people, but to the unsaved, the unsainted. Are you active in the ministry of the saints? We think about ministry, we think about a pastor and his work, or we think about an evangelist, like Brother Kermit was acting as our evangelist this past week. But think about the laity and the lay people and you and your need to minister to others. Are you active or are you passive? Now there's five areas of our life I want to talk about. One of them is your prayer life. Are you active in your prayer life or are you passive? Are you not active? And I think all of us have to hold our head down a little bit because although many of us may be praying every day, we may have a regular time of prayer, but we all have to say as Aaron was praying, Lord, there's a lot of room for improvement in our lives. In particular, in our prayer life. And I want you, you've got, maybe some of you may be missing a finger or a thumb, I don't know, but maybe you've got five fingers on the other, and if you don't, you've got five toes on the foot. Surely somebody's got a hand or a foot that's got five fingers or toes on it. So I'm going to talk to you about five things, and you just count for yourself, and you judge yourself today. Am I active in not only my prayer life, but in my, the same thing, devotional life, in my do I have private devotions? Do I read my Bible privately? Do I pray privately? Do I have family devotions? Do we get together ever as a family, as a husband and wife team, and read the Bible, read the Scripture? Am I active or am I passive? You know, we live in a passive society. Maybe you've heard that say. We live in a society that's very active in temporal things and vain things, and things that don't amount to a lot, but they're very passive in the things of God. Very inactive, very much not active in the things of God. Area number one, your prayer life, your devotional life, your fellowship with God, your reading the Bible and so on. Would you, if you had to tell the Lord, Lord, I'm active or I'm passive. I just don't care. I'm not as concerned about it as I should be. If you had to answer to God face to face today, would you say, Lord, I'm active? Or Lord, I'm somewhat active, but I'm passive also. I'm not active. Okay? In your prayer life, your daily devotional life, your Bible reading, your family devotions, are you active or are you not? You answer that question. Don't tell me. Don't tell anybody else. But do you think you're really as active as you should be? Okay? Okay? The second area is the area of witness. Are you active in your witness to others? Do you actively talk to other people about Jesus? Well, preacher, I believe it's important to set the example. Amen to that. I'll agree with that. 100%. It is important to set the example. But it's also important to talk about Jesus. To share Jesus as Kermit was telling us last night to declare Jesus, to tell others about Him. Are you active or are you passive? See, the devil is on his job today, and I'm not giving him any credit, and I'm not praising him, but he's doing everything in his power to render us inactive, to get us to sit down and do nothing. Does it seem like we're running an hour behind this morning? It does to me. It seems like it's awful late in the day already. And I woke up earlier than even it would have if it had been the regular time. But praise the Lord, probably went to bed later last night than it would have too. But we need to get active in the things of God. We need to get active in our witness, in our contact with other people. Making contact with people every day. And you do make contact with somebody every day. We seldom, hardly ever live a day all to ourselves. Although, maybe sometimes you would like to. You like to say, well, there's days I like to be all alone. Sure, we all feel that way. But hardly ever do you have a day that you're all alone. You're always in contact with somebody. Well, you're a witness to those people you're in contact with. You are being some kind of a witness, whether it's a good witness or a poor witness. You're being a witness. Are you active or are you passive in our society? Give me an idea of passive entertainment. Passive time. We say pastime. 
You know, I've seen statistics, and I don't have any to quote to you, but it's unreal how many hours our children are sitting in front of the TV, passive entertainment, just absorbed in what's put out there. And you and I both know there's a lot of things that just aren't very wholesome, just aren't very healthy. Recently a couple said to me, Preacher, you can't regulate the programs that are on TV because it's also filthy and rotten and just flipping the channels. You'll hear and see things that aren't fit. But I'm using this as an example to show you that we have a passive society. Kids come in, they sit down, they hardly ever open their books, they don't do their homework, parents don't encourage them because parents are so actively involved in passive entertainment. Just listen to whatever's there, just look at whatever's there, and take it in. That'll have an effect on you, beloved. You can't just view anything and expect to be a Christian, a, a spiritual Christian. Okay? Now I'm not fussing at you this morning, but I'm just telling you that we live in a passive society. We live in a society where people just accept whatever. Just accept it. You know, it's always been, it'll always be just accept it. But I want to challenge you to become more active in what you view. To make a choice, as Kermit preached here one night. Choose who you'll serve. Choose how you're going to spend your time. Choose the company that you keep. Choose the kind of friends that you run with and spend time with. And don't let the world press you into its mold and make you just a passive creature. A complacent, unconcerned, cold, and indifferent individual that can care less whether there's revival, whether the people get saved or not. We don't need to be passive people. We need to be active people. We need to be active in our area of witness. I have a desire to witness to more people than I do, Roy. And I find it a problem in my personal everyday life to have the courage a lot of times to just walk up to the big bruisers that you work with, big muscular men, and say, hey, do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? I have a personal problem. Okay? Maybe you do. And maybe you pick out some scrawny little wimp, some individual, you say, well, I'll go over and talk to him. But you know, we ought not to be any respecter of persons. We ought to be willing to talk to wealthy people. And we ought not to exclude the poor. We, in the area of witness, we need to be active and we need to be trying to win everybody. A lot of times, maybe you don't have the education somebody else has and you say, well, I feel intimidated. I feel afraid to be able to talk with somebody like that. They're so educated and I just feel so out of place. If you have a personal experience with Jesus Christ, you can tell that to the most educated or to the least educated person and it will have a burden on them. You answer the question for yourself. Am I active? Am I somewhat active? Or am I just totally passive? I could care less. Or I know I should be witnessing, but I just don't witness in my conversation, in my words, in my speech, as I should. Well, I want to tell you, your conversation is an indicator of what's going on down inside. Your conversation. The kind of talk you use is an outward indicator of what's going on in your heart. The Apostle Peter denied, flatly denied that he knew Jesus. He said, I tell you, I don't know him. I'm not one of his disciples. Well, you're a Galilean. Your speech is like the Galileans. You sound like the Galileans, and his disciples are Galileans. And so your speech tells us, Peter, that you are one of his followers, that you do know him. And so our speech tells whether we're really active for the Lord or passive, we could care less. If all you ever talk about is what's going on in the world, the World Series and all that, and all that's got its place. But if you never talk about Jesus, how are the people you're in contact with daily going to know that you love the Lord and that you're concerned about them? See, this is for all of us. A little test. We've already covered two areas. The area of prayer, daily devotions, your, your Bible reading and so on. And now the area of your witness. Are you actively witnessing to other people? Are you in contact with people? And are you making a good impression on them as a child of God? If you didn't tell them, Hey, I'm saved. I'm a Christian. I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Does your speech tell them as much? Does your actions and your attitude and so on? The third area I want you to check yourself on is worship. Worship. I'd like to stress to you the need to worship 
God today. I had a definition somewhere, may have lost it, of what worship is. A high family. Worship is the act of paying divine honors to God. Webster says to a deity. But true worship is worshiping God. Okay? There's a lot of false worship. Yes, I'll grant you that. Worship is reverence. Do we really reverence God? Do we really pay divine honors to God? Worship is submissive respect. Do we really have a respectful submission in our lives? Are we submitted to the Lord? Are we committed to Him, to His ministry, to witnessing, to a daily communion with Him on a personal level? Are we submitting ourselves respectfully to God? That's worship. Worship is not only lifting your hands toward heaven. That's part of and a form of worship. Lifting holy hands without wrath and doubt. Giving God honor and praise and saying thanks. Thank you, Lord, and glory to God and things like that. But worship is something that ought to be, we ought to be active in in our everyday lives. We ought to submit ourselves respectfully to God and reverence God in everything we do and say. If you've got a job to do, and somebody was sharing this with me recently, a young convert. They said, you know, I hurt myself and ordinarily I would have had a fit. I would have thrown a tantrum. I would have gotten mad and I would have said things. Maybe I shouldn't have said it. But the person said, that didn't happen this time. Well, praise God. You know, that's evidence that you've been changed. That you truly have Christ in your heart. Okay? And if there's no difference, then I say we need to go to Calvary and let God make a difference. Are you active in your worship of God? Worship is loving or admiring <coughs> devotion. Do I really love the Lord? Do I admire Him? Do I devote my time to Him? You know, it's 24 hours in a day. And I don't know how you're spending your time. And I know that I can make better use of mine. But how much time do we spend actively worshiping God? You know? In the area of worship. I want to stress the need to worship. And we need to be more free in our worship here at church. We ought to feel free that if you hear something preached, if it's scriptural and you feel like saying amen, you ought to have the kind of freedom that you could say, amen. That's right. That's so. That's the way it is. But we have been rendered passive in our worship. We think we've got to sit back and let the preacher do it all. Don't be so passive in your worship. We come here to worship God. Well, I want to encourage you to worship Him. I realize we don't all worship God in the same way. But you worship God in whatever way is comfortable to you. I've read of people worshiping the Bible, some simply bowed their heads and worshiped. Some fell down on the ground, face down, and worshiped God in that way. You know, it's not the position of the body so much as the attitude and the position of your heart. But are you really active in worship? You know, reading your Bibles, we can worship God in many different ways. Giving an offering. Maybe we don't think of it that way. But when you contribute to the cause of Christ, that is an act of worship. You're paying a divine honor to God by rendering unto God what is due unto Him. Remember Jesus when He took the little, said, uh, give me a coin. Whose image is here? They tried to ensnare Him. Do we pay tribute to Caesar or no? He said, whose image is on the coin? They said, well, Caesar's image is there, Lord. And Jesus gave a very wise answer. He said, render unto Caesar the things that are due to Caesar and render unto God the things that are due to God. You know, we're sometimes really lifting men up when we should be lifting up the Lord. We can actually be guilty of worshiping men and honoring men above their due honor. And we need to come back to honoring God and worshiping God. In the area of worship, do you really feel free to worship God in spirit? You know, with all of your spirit, with all of your heart, in spirit and in truth. Would you say I'm active or I'm partially active or I'm passive? Which is I'm not active in worshiping God. We come to church a lot of times and never worship. And I'm confident that if we can't worship God here, we don't do a lot of worshiping God outside the church. This is a place that's been set aside, designated as a house of prayer, a house of worship. 
But if you're not careful, you'll come with the attitude, well, let the rest of them do what they want to do. I don't care. But that's not a Christian attitude. Jesus had a very caring attitude. He didn't have a don't care attitude. Here's one that's going to get close to some of us, and sadly, a lot of people that should be here to hear it are not here this morning. But in the area of church attendance and participation in church activities, am I active or am I passive? Am I active in midweek prayer service? Am I active in the Sunday school class? Am I active on Sunday night? Am I active when there's a revival meeting? Am I active in church visitation or in personal visitation through the week? Am I active in visiting the sick, activities of the church? Am I active in my church attendance? Well, I'll get there if I can. So many people seem to have that attitude. We ought to say, I'll make every effort possible to be there. There was an older lady in the congregation where I used to be a member and I was active in that congregation my home church and she said a lot of people look for an excuse to stay out of church she said I look for all the reasons I can to be there and she was there the last I heard when I was in revival over in uh, Coburn I met a pastor there that is a pastor of the church where the lady comes I may have that wrong but he knew the lady she's in her 90's and he said hey she's still faithful she's still active in the services she still comes regular. And so are we active in our church attendance and in the church activities? Now, here's another area. We've looked at it quite a bit since I've been here. And that's the area of the commission or the responsibility of the church. I'd like for us to review just quickly what the Great Commission is. Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Are we active as a church in the commission of evangelizing the world, of making disciples of the world, of those in the world around us? He said, go. Who's to go? You're to go. I'm to go. Well, I can't go to Honduras preacher, but the church has been very supportive of the teams that have gone, and the church has been very active in missionary support, and that's good, and that's very commendable. But you know, you've got your Jerusalem right here. I want to remind you of that. You've got your home area, your community. If you live over on the east side of the valley, or if you live over on the south side of town, or you live up uh, out in Weber City, or wherever, wherever you live, there is your Jerusalem. And Jesus said to the disciples, the commission was originally given to the eleven, because Judas, you know what happened to him. But he told them to go, to go into all nations, and they went everywhere preaching the gospel. Not only did they preach at Jerusalem, they went to Samaria, they went to Judea, and they went even into the uttermost parts of the earth. And we are commissioned too to preach the gospel, but are we active in the commission? A lot of churches are inactive. A lot of churches are passive. A lot of church members are passive when it comes to that. Some people wouldn't even contribute a few dollars to help a missionary go and preach the gospel in areas where we could not go. There's places we couldn't possibly go. Carlos Noriega was here a couple of Wednesday nights ago. He has a work in Lima, Peru. Believe you me, I don't have any desire to go into a place like that man is preaching. In little alleyways where there's prostitution and there's drugs and there's... People stealing things and robbing and killing and mugging and fighting and all kinds of ugly, ugly things going on. But Carlos has been blessed to go into an area just like that. We need to pray for people like Carlos. You see, through prayer we can be active in the commission. But through witnessing in the community around us and in the workplace and in our everyday routine, we can be active in the commission. But we live in a passive society. People have sit back, they folded their arms, and they've said, well, we paid the missionaries to do that, let them do it. How often do you pray for missionaries? How often do you pray for your pastors? How often do you pray for evangelists? And how often do you pray for your Sunday school teacher and so on? For what purpose are we to go? We're to go to guide men to Christ. Philip the evangelist preached in Samaria. There were great numbers of people that received the Word of God, and they were happy. There was joy, great joy in the city. Then he went and joined himself to a church. There was one Ethiopian man. He said, how can I understand what I read except some man should guide me? And Philip guided that man. He led that man to Christ one-on-one. -on -one. You can do the same. 
You can lead people to Christ just like Philip the evangelist did. Why are we to go? John 3.16, that Kermit preached to us here on Wednesday night. Because Christ is the head of the body and He has commissioned us. He has commanded us to go and tell the world that God loves them still. I want to tell you something, people. We're very passive here in this church. Although, in some areas, we're very active. We'd have to say, Lord, there's areas that I'm not very active. I need to be more active. How are we to go to people? We're to go to them with the love. Accepting them for who they are and for what they are. Not with a judgmental attitude of, hey, fellow, you better do this and you better do that and you've got to straighten all this mess up. Kermit preached, and I know it helped us all. He preached real clearly that you don't straighten your life up in order to be saved. But you get saved, and then you trust Christ to help you straighten your life up. Habits, things that you're accustomed to doing, things that are bad, that are harmful to you spiritually, harmful to your testimony, you trust Christ after you've been saved, and He helps you then in those areas. Well, now is the day of salvation. You know, are we active in the commission? Are we active in the commission? We could be more active in preaching the gospel. Now look, the devil, I want to tell you how he fits into all this. He's trying to get us to focus on the wrong things. You know, you ever get up in the morning and your eyes are crossed, or they're maybe not crossed, but they just don't focus? When I wake up in the morning, I see... Things that are right there in the room all the time. Maybe it's the way the light's coming through the window. Maybe it's the shadow of the curtain. But you know when you wake up, you're about half crazy anyway. You're just half here and half there. and You're coming out of the twilight zone. And you see things and you're just half dreaming. And maybe the curtains will look like somebody standing there. I don't know if y'all are like that or not, are you? I am. When I wake up and the first thing I see, I'm still dreaming. And it just, it don't look like what it really is. And then I wake up and I say, well, that's nothing. That's just... Just a light hitting the wall. Are you all that way? Josh is. At least he's one honest man. The rest of you just don't want to admit it. But Okay? What I'm saying is you're focused. You wake up in the morning, maybe your eyes aren't focused the way. And uh, the devil is trying to get us to focus on the wrong things in life. Okay? One reason we have such a passive society and such a passive church world and such passive people, inactive people, is here's one thing. The devil has us focusing on our past failures. And we've all made mistakes, and we've all been failures in certain things. But the devil likes to get you to focusing on that and thinking about that. Well, look, you tried to win people to the Lord, but you failed. And he likes to get you just focusing on that. And then he says, you can't do it. It didn't work before. Ha uh ha. -huh. And it ain't going to work again. Goody, goody. The devil says, I've got you right where I want you. You're just an old failure. And he gets you to focusing on that. Well, so what? We've all failed. I'd rather fail for Jesus as to not even try for Him and to be a failure for the devil, wouldn't you? But the devil has a lot of times you and me, beloved. I'm not talking about somebody else right now. I'm talking about us. He has us focusing on our past failures. Maybe you tried to win somebody to the Lord, to witness to them, and you got persecuted. The devil says, aha, uh -huh, look at that. They talked rough to you. They cursed you out. They, they talked bad to you. Look, you ain't going to try that again, are you? And the devil gets you to focusing on the fact that you was persecuted a little bit. Somebody said, well, you're an old fanatic. Or leave your religion at home or something like that. And the devil a lot of times has us focusing on our losses. Maybe we did lead somebody to Christ, but maybe they didn't follow through. Maybe they weren't faithful. Maybe they didn't get the discipline in their lives. And maybe they were not discipled and taught, instructed as they should have been. And the devil says, well, look, they didn't last. They didn't make it. So why should you? And so instead of focusing on our past failures and focusing on our losses, people that started out and they didn't stay with it, we need to be focusing on the fact that God said go. The fact that the Lord has helped us to understand we need an active prayer life, an active devotional life. We need an active witness. And we need an active worship. And we need to be active in church attendance and uh, church activities and now in the commission. The devil a lot of times has us focusing on our weaknesses. And that goes to Philippians, the verse we read. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
We take the attitude, I can't, I can't, I can't. We need to take the attitude, I can, I can, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We don't need to be just a passive individual and say, well, the rest of the world is not active. Why should I be? The majority of our country just goes to church on Sunday morning. Why should I go on Sunday night? Or why should I go to a midweek prayer service? Or why should I do anything else? That's not wise. We're going to get down to that. The devil a lot of times has us focusing on problems of the past. Strife. Discord. <clears throat> Any church that's been a church for any length of time has had its problems. We've had ours here in the past. But let's not focus on the past problems. If there's been strife, if there's been hard feelings, we don't need to be focusing on that today. We need to forgive and forgive and love and accept people. But many times the devil has us focusing on the problems of the past and we can't go forward as a church. I want to tell you that God's vision for this church is for us to grow. I said God's vision. Now is our vision God's vision? Where do you see our church five years from now? I have a great desire in my heart to see people one to the Lord. And I am confident that the majority of you at least share that same desire with me. That's God's will. God wants us to grow as a congregation. But at the same time, it's going to be necessary for some of us to rise up and take on the responsibility of leadership so that when God does give us other people in the church, we can help them and we can minister to them and we can disciple them and we can see them grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord. Everybody's not a leader. But we can all be better leaders. Now I know I hit a nail on the head when I said that the devil has us many times you come to church and you can't get the past off your mind. You're thinking about problems, things that came up, strifes and divisions in the past. Well, those things are always going to be, beloved. But let's not, to use an old proverb, cry over spilt milk. It'll never be the same. Once there's been strife and once there's been division, it'll never be like it once was. But we're going to have to pick up the broken pieces from here forward and go on with Jesus Christ. See, instead of focusing on the problems of the past, we need to get actively involved in what is going on in church and be a part of the process and say, here I am, what can I do to help make it a better place, a better church, a better community in which to live? Many times the devil has us focusing on our past life. Look in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And let's see what God says about that. You see, the devil says, well, you were a rotten person. I mean, you had a rotten past, a sinful past. And if he will, he will bring it up, won't he, Roy? He'll bring it right up before you and he'll say, remember this, remember that. Well, here's what I choose to remember this morning. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Well, devil, I've got news for you. <clears throat> My past is under the blood. And I choose not to remember it today. And you're not going to bother me with it today because Christ has forgiven me of all my sinful past. He gave me a new start and a new life and I'm a new creature because I'm in Christ Jesus the Lord. And so let's not be focusing on our past life. Some of us may have been morally good people in a lot of ways, but we were all vile sinners. But we don't need to be thinking too much about our past life. What about your present life? What about today? How is it with you today? Are you active in the Lord's work? Many times the devil wants us. Look at 2 Corinthians 10, 12. <clears throat> he gets us to looking at everybody else and comparing ourselves with everybody else and saying that's the standard, the way everybody does it, and so therefore that's the way I'm going to do it. 2 Corinthians 10, 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. 
But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. It's very unwise. We can even say it's foolish. For you and me to look around and say, well, there's so-and-so and there's that group and they're doing this and they're not doing that. And in comparing myself with them or him or her, that's not a wise thing to do. The devil, though, he wants us to look around us. He wants us to compare ourselves with everybody around us. What's the next church doing? God's not holding us accountable for what the next church is doing. He's holding us accountable for what our church is doing or what we're not doing. And the last thing I want to share is this. The devil sometimes just gets us wrapped up in our cares of life. Just too busy. We're too busy to get together and talk about good things, the things of God. We're too busy to visit anyone that's sick. We're too busy to visit anyone that's lost and invite them to church or to take a moment of time through the day when you make contact with people. Brother Stallard, I think, in the past, uh, he was inviting somebody there in the supermarket to get uh, saved, to come to church or whatever, I don't remember, but when I first came here they was talking about that. When you go to the grocery store, there's an opportunity to witness. People come into your place of business, there's an opportunity to witness. There was a fellow in work uh, Friday. <clears throat> Somebody said, you know him? He's a preacher. I didn't know him, but I had work to do, and I walked by the fountain to get a drink, and I said, uh, so-and-so tells me you're a preacher. Yeah, that's right. I said, if you don't care, walk over here to the saw where I'm working and I'll talk to you while I'm working. I believe we ought to do the work that we have agreed to do. I don't believe that it's a good witness for us to kill a lot of time on the job, even though you mean well, and you may be talking about the right thing, but you need to be careful how you do it. You can do it at break time, or you can do it while you're working. But I'm a firm believer we ought to be busy on the job if we're getting paid, we ought to do it. Well, now let's turn it for the Lord's work. We ought to be busy for the Lord. We're too busy cleaning the gardens off, mowing the yard, taking the kids here and there, doing this, doing that, doing the other, and so on and so on and so on. Right? But sometimes we get too busy for our own good. Mark 4 and 19 is a verse of Scripture that Jesus dealt with that, and that's our closing verse today. Mark chapter 4 and verse 19. Jesus was talking here about the sower had gone out to sow and the seed fell in different places. But in verse 19 he says, In the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things. Let's not ever get so busy that we can't take time for Jesus. First thing every morning, you should take time at least to pray. To thank God He had mercy on you while you rested through the night. That He gave you life and health to be able to get up out of bed another day. To face another day. You need somewhere to have a time in your personal life that you read the Bible every day. Read some of God's Word every day. And commit yourself to it. See, this is how God speaks to us. Prayer, we speak to Him. Reading the Bible, He speaks to us. But aren't we... <clears throat> Pretty much a passive group sometimes. So you don't have to tell me how you see yourself today. Because God sees you better than you see yourself. And He knows how active you are or how passive you are. Don't let the world press you into its mold. But let's be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ by getting into His Word, being active in our prayer life, our daily devotional life, our witness our worship, our church attendance, and in the commission of reaching out and winning others. You know, one of the biggest areas of failure also is that once we get people to make a profession of faith, boom, we drop them. But you know what we should do, and I'd like to encourage this, we ought to have a buddy system here in church. When I was a kid, we used to, we, I went on one occasion to a Bible camp, and there was a lake there, and they said, we're going to have a buddy system. Everybody's going to pick a buddy and you're responsible for your buddy and you watch out for your buddy. That was a safety measure. You know, somebody went under, there was somebody, hollering, hey, Joe's under over here. Come over and help me pull him out. The buddy system. And it'd be good if each of us could adopt a younger convert. Just determine our hearts. I'm going to take a special interest in that person. And I'm going to try to spend some time with them. 
And I'm going to share with them things that I've already learned from the Word of God. And I'll tell you, it would be good. God would bless that. He really would. If we would take the younger people who come into the church, take them under our wings, so to speak. If we've got some years with the Lord and some experience, we ought to be like a mother, older women should. And older men should be like a father to those younger individuals. And we that are along the same age group, we ought to treat one another like brothers and sisters and love each other in the same way. <clears throat> We're pretty much passive, though, when it comes to discipleship and follow up and help the people to get established. But that's something I'd like to see change. I'd like to see it change right here. I'm not, I don't know how it's been in the past. But I would like for us to make available to the younger converts opportunities that we can get together if it have to be in our homes and study the Bible and disciple, discipline, and encourage the younger people in the Lord. It'll help out some of us older people that's been in the Lord for a while. I don't know how you did on your test this morning, on your little self checkup, self examination. I don't know how you did on it, but <clears throat> honestly, I am a pretty passive person a lot of times. And that bothers me. It does. I know we've got things that have to be done. There's no question. Meals have to be prepared. And clothes have to be washed. And all the daily routine, those things have to be done. Yes. But let's see if we can't schedule a little more of our time for God and for the things of God. You know...